Welcome to the Periodic Catcher. In this version of the program, we're going to be looking at the one type of uh, flavor of the Periodic Catcher that refers to the elements. And this is mainly designed for a, a science classroom, or if you just wanted to run the program as part of a video, video game design program, that certainly would work there as well. Okay, so some of the major learning objectives that we're going to look at is how to create a game that can be expanded. We're going to also create some functions that allow the user the input and interact with other sprites. We're going to use global variables, which will be used to help keep the score. We'll be applying some nested if-else conditions to help us make logical decisions. Then we'll be utilizing the random number operator block to help make the game more enjoyable because random numbers are what make video games very interesting. One thing to note before we run this program is that you may not have a lot of experience with Scratch or programming, so just try to follow along as best you can. I'll be explaining the uh, code. This is uh, one of the videos where I actually will be putting the code together with you as we go uh, along through the instructions. My plan is to have a window of Scratch up beside the written instructions for the periodic catcher that's going to be, uh, it's going to be stored in the PDF file. Before we jump into the instructions, I want to quickly show you what the completed program will look like. Um, before I start playing this, it gets really noisy and very distracting, so I'm going to debrief you on what it looks like before I start playing because I always find that I can't talk straight whenever it's playing, and I have a, have a hard enough time talking straight as it is, so I'm going to make sure I explain this thoroughly. So what you're going to see is this little robot person up here, and they're going to move back and forth, left and right, and the robot is going to drop symbols down, which are represented by these three sprites. And you can see they're kind of color coordinated there. And they'll throw the symbols down, and the paddle down here will have to catch the sprite. And the key is the paddle is going to have to catch the correct sprite based upon which element type you are given down here below in this message where it says catch metals. So you will catch all the different sprites that are the metal sprites. Now, when the users play this, they're not going to know where it's coming from or you know which elements coming up next and they may not even know what type of category well the, whether they'll have to catch metals metalloids or non-metals so it's all going to be randomized and they're never going to know what they're going to have to pick up and as the robot throws the items down or excuse me the elements if you catch the right one you're going to get points and if you catch the wrong ones it'll deduct points and just to make things more interesting. This may not be great game design, but what I've done is whenever you miss an element that you were not supposed to catch and it gets down to the bottom, it'll add points for missing all the wrong elements. And if you miss a correct element, which means say we're trying to catch metals and our uh, good friend, the metal element starts dropping down, and we don't catch it, then we'll lose points for missing the correct ones as well. So there's kind of a double way of getting points and losing points as well. So this is what it'll look like. And every time you catch the right element, I've kind of made this little faint, uh, kind of faint type green kind of mask image to come across the screen with this sprite down here that I call shader. And I'll explain how that works later. And then if you uh, get points deducted, then the shader will show up as red. Okay, so here it comes. It's telling us to catch non-metals. All right, so we got points for missing the metals. And I promise you this is all random. All right, here we go. Boom, got ourselves some non-metals. Now you can see our points up at the very top are actually increasing and decreasing based on what we uh, collect. Over here, the game timer is going to reduce over a certain amount of time. You'll be able to adjust as you go along. Okay, hopefully you're able to hear me talking and not just get all the crazy sounds. All the sounds that you heard came from the Scratch program, so we're able to just use the uh, sound effects that I have in place to make some pretty neat effects on our games. I'm going to arrange my desktop like so in order for me to be able to work in Scratch and to see the instructions in the same window. Your monitor or laptop screen may not be large enough to do this, uh, so it just really depends on how you have your um, 
desktop organized. However, mine will be set up this way. If yours looks different, no big deal. You can just follow along with the video to see how I'm putting uh, everything together. Another thing right here, I switched files. I opened up a file called Periodic Catcher Student, and the Periodic Catcher Student is going to have all the graphics and sound effects and everything else you need in order to make the program I just showed you. It's not going to contain any of the code. Also, to make the um, stage window right here a little bit smaller so you have a little bit more room to program since I kind of crammed everything in here, you click on this little arrow right there and it's going to allow you to uh, make the stage window small. And I think you can also do it, yeah, you can do it right there, small stage layout. Okay, so let's go ahead and put it like so. And if we look over here on our instructions, if you're new to the way I do things with uh, programming Scratch, I always have my uh, title page with my lessons that I give to the students. And we go to the next page. Here I show you all the different art assets that you'll need for the program. I'll tell you the name of the file right here, which is Periodic Catcher. Um, mine's Periodic Catcher Student, but it's the same thing. You'll be able to get it from our website. And then right here are all the different sprites that we'll need for our program. And over here is the stage, and I have the stage here as well. Down here below, we tell you how many costumes that each of the different sprites have. Okay, and we go to the next page. And then right here, this gigantic green circle. We put that there so the students know when to start programming. And there will be a red octagon at the very end that tells them when to stop. So that way they don't get confused between the written instructions and the instructions that teach you how to program. So sometimes there will be an explanation about particular pieces of code, and we separate the two so students, when they're reading about some overlying concept or theory that associates with computer science, that way they don't get confused with what they're supposed to be physically doing inside of Scratch. Okay, so let's move over here to our first step inside of Scratch. Just quick breakdown, the blue boxes will contain the uh, code blocks that you'll need to use. There'll be a little number out there beside the type of block that you'll, and tells you how many of those different types of blocks you need. The other blue boxes will also tell you what type of broadcast messages and what type of global variables you will need to make. The red boxes, they're going to give you a brief piece of information that might relate to either the whole function or it could give you specific details about a particular combination of blocks within a particular function. In this case, this function right here that we're going to program, it says this function will control the starting of the game with the broadcast messages. So this function, when it runs, it's going to wait half a second, then broadcast out these three messages, which essentially is a message that gets sent to other functions within the program. It's going to wait one second, and then it'll send out these other two broadcast messages. Okay, that's all it's going to do right there. So I'm going to pause the video and get my mind organized, and then we'll go ahead and put these uh, functions together. I switched the screens and Right down here on step 1A, this is telling us that this is the first step. We're working on the stage, and the letter behind the number tells us that there's going to be multiple steps whenever we program the stage. If there, there was no letter there, that would tell us that this would be the only step for this particular um, item, which in this case is the stage. So first things first, let's go ahead and we're going to create this function right here. And one of the things we need to do while we create the function is we need to create these um, variables right here. So we're going to do that while we program that. Sorry, I had to pause the video for a second. Okay, so we're going to start off with the stage right here, and we're going to program this function. So we want to go over here to events, and we want to get two, uh, yeah, let's just program one at a time. Okay, I know the number here tells us that there's two, but I'm going to focus on this one function right here, and I'm just going to go by visually looking at it. These numbers are right here in case you want to mass produce these, or you want to double check all the number of blocks that you have. So I got my green hat tool. I'm going to go to control. I'm going to get my weight. I'll put it right there. Then I'm going to go back to events and get my broadcast message. Put that right there. Right click, choose duplicate. Put another one, right click, duplicate, put that right there. I'm going to go up to wait, right click, choose duplicate, put this right here, get rid of the extra one. And now you notice this function right here looks similar to this one over here. 
Now I need to go in and change the data input information for this particular item. And we want this actually, that's one second. And next we want to create these messages. So first message, we'll go ahead and create that one. We'll call this start robot. Then the next one, we'll create another new message. We'll call this one start paddle. Third message down, we're going to call this one start element to catch. And just so you know, I'm using a naming convention where you start with a lowercase. That's kind of common with programming. If you don't use it, it's no big deal. It's just kind of a it's kind of a nerd thing. That's what we do. Down here on the bottom, we're going to create two more messages. Next one's going to be a random number for elements. That's a mouthful. And then we'll create a final message for the fifth broadcast block. We'll call that one start timer. Okay. Next, we want to create this function right down here below. Again, I'm just going to visually look at the functions and go ahead and drag everything over there. So I'll put the start block there. We'll go over here to looks to get the switch backdrop to. And then I'm going to come over here to my data, and I'm going to get a, oh, these variables. I forgot. These were already created for me since I had um, created this item. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pause the video and delete these so you can see me create them from scratch. Okay, I paused the video so I can go back and create these variables. All right, to make a variable, click on make a variable. And then we're going to create the name. It's called player score and click on OK. And you'll notice all these uh, variable blocks show up like so. I'm going to go ahead and drag it right there. And I'm going to right click and choose duplicate. And I need five of these. So I'm going to go to the first set. My right click and choose duplicate. It'll duplicate everything underneath it. So that way I created two at a time. Just saves you a little bit of uh, extra effort there when you're programming these things. Then we're going to come over here and create a couple more variables. And we're going to call this one random element number. And then we're going to create another variable called element to catch. Then we're going to create another variable called element whoops, drop rate. And then we'll create another variable called game time. Now that you have all the variables created, let's go ahead and change that over here on the bottom function. Uh, first, switch backdrop to. It's been listed as right element. Click on this drop down arrow and you'll be able to switch it to normal play. Okay, and you're probably wondering where the backdrops are coming from. These were preloaded with the model that you downloaded from the website to start this program. So there's the different backdrops that we'll be using. And we switch to the normal plane one right there. So come back to your scripts panel. And then over here on our drop down for the variables, we're going to set those. And let's see. It should be changed. There we go. I wasn't clicking. All right. So we want to switch the first one to actually player score. Sorry, set. Then we want the next one to be random num or random uh, random element numbers. Then the third one down, we want element to catch, and we'll finish programming this in a second. Fourth one down, element drop rate. And then the final one, we're going to switch this to game time, and you can do this in any order. You notice I didn't fill in the data input areas for the variables. I just kind of skipped over that. So here on the element to drop rate, or excuse me, element drop rate, let's set that to a negative 5. Then over here on game time, we're going to set that to 30. And then for the random element number, we're going to put a random number in here. So go over to your operators, which are a particular type of tool. There's quite a few in here. We want the pick random with these two data input sections. And we'll click and drag it over here to the oops to the element to catch section and then from here we want to select from one to whoops three okay so pick random one to three so it's going to pick from one to three on the values and we'll use that number later on to figure out which one of these element types that we'll catch when the program starts running 
if you switch to page five in the curriculum or the lesson here, you'll notice that this is the same two functions we just programmed. However, there's some detailed explanation to what's going on with these different functions. Go ahead and pause the video and take the time to read through these. Um, I can't think of anything to add to the information that's already listed here. So just go ahead and pause the video and take the time to go through and read all this material. Okay, we're moving on to page six and you'll notice down here on bottom of page six, the step has now been listed as step 1.B. If I go back here, you'll notice the area I just talked about on page five was step 1A. And if you go back further, you'll notice step 1A actually started on page four. So step 1A comprises two different pages. And 1B, since it's a new letter, that means we're going, we're going to program some new functions with this. And we're also going to create some new broadcast messages right here. Okay, so I want to take the, these blocks and move them up. I'm kind of limit on space since I'm trying to cram everything in here so you can see both sides of the window. What I'm going to do is I'm going to program these two functions right here. So we want to go to our vents. And then let's get our when I receive hat block and drag that down. And you'll notice we already have this broadcast message set right here. And over here we have four new broadcast messages that we'll create. And we'll create those when we get to them here in the code. Okay, next we want to go to the data. We want to get a set block. And then we want to also go ahead and get operators and pick random. And just so you know, it doesn't really matter the order you put these in. If you remember last time I just clicked and dragged and build it out, then I filled in some of the details. This time I'm just going to go ahead and fill in the details as I go, just because there's much more details than in previous sections. Okay, and oops, I forgot to change this one. So we want to change that to random element numbers. We're going to keep that from 1 to 3. Then over here, we're going to set that to 0.1. And this will all be explained. Actually, you can pause the video and read right here, and it tells you everything that we're doing. Okay, I want to get a if else block. Let's see how many of these I need. I need two. So if I look right here, there's the first if else block, and then the second one is nested inside of it right there. Okay, it's right inside of it. I'm gonna go ahead and get the second one, and I'm gonna click and drag it and put it right down here in the else section. If you look real close, you can see this is where it fits in. All right, now that I have that built out, I'm gonna go over here to my operators and I'm going to get a equal boolean hex block like so and then I want to get a oh looks like Apple leads the rally in the tech sector there so we want to get the uh, random element number I'm gonna get rid of this uh, hope you got money invested in Apple and then we go ahead and set this to a one and over here on the events, we want to get a broadcast message. We're going to click and put it right inside right there. And now you notice when I click down, I don't have this one available, which is called start non-metal. So I'm going to create a new message, and we'll just go ahead and call it start non-metal. Whoops, not mental. You know I am mental. Okay, so start non-metal. Okay, we got that right there. And looks like I need two more. I can see it right there. So I'm going to right click, duplicate, put one right there, right click, duplicate, and put one right there. And I also want to put another uh, Boolean hex block right here with the equal symbol. So I'm going to right click, choose duplicate, and put it like so. And this one was set to one. I'm going to set this one equal to two. And let's see. Oh, right here, this is wait 0.1 second, and this one over here is listed as 0 0.1. It doesn't matter, the zero is, doesn't really signify anything at that point in time. If you had 0 0.1 enter like so, it's still going to be the same as 0 0.1. Okay, right here, so we want to change this to a start metal. We'll have to create that. So we want to start metal. Then we want to change this one to start metalloid. And we want one more broadcast message down at the end. And we're going to call this one Robot Animation. And there you go. So your first function, let's double check all the details, make sure we got it built out correctly. 
always go through and verify that you have all the information in here and looks like we are good to go in this function and now I'm going to build this final function right here so I bet we can do it right now I'm gonna click and drag this up here just so I have some more room you notice how that I can stack these on top of each other it doesn't really affect how the program works it's just a kind of an easy way to get everything out of a crammed space okay next actually I'll put it down here if you need to pause so you can see the code go ahead and do that but now I'm gonna move it back okay so we want a when I receives and we're going to choose a start timer which is right here and we need a repeat until block and that tells us that the code inside of it is going to keep repeating until some sort of conditions met and we're going to check that with a less than operator block which we'll put right there we want to get a variable called start or game time there it is put it right there and these variables just so you know are called global variables that means everything or every sprite and object inside your program can access those. Next, we want a wait block. We're going to put that inside there. And what we're building right now is a simple little timer that can count backwards, and then it can actually do something with information once it gets to that point in time. Okay, let's get a data block. And this one's different. We haven't used this one. It's called change game time. We'll put that underneath the wait block. And we're going to change that positive one to a negative one. And then we want to put another change block. We're going to put our light right there. And we want that to be a negative 0 0.125. And then below that, we are going to put a broadcast block right here. And we're going to change that one to game over. And it looks like I don't have it made. So this is a good opportunity for me to make another broadcast message and broadcast messages they are essentially internal messages for the program that is sent throughout scratch that tell any block or excuse me any function that has the same message attached at its top for it to start whenever it receives that message okay so basically they're if you think about it in I don't know phone terms they're kind of like text messages and these text messages send out to people who are ready to receive that text message and when they receive it they can actually perform some sort of action based upon that message okay so that looks like all of the functions we need for step 1b and before we go to the next step I wanted to bring something up okay you will notice I have the red block boxes right here these are going to tell you what all the information or excuse me what all the programming does inside of it so pause the video and take the time to read those when we go to the next page, which is page 7, you'll notice on page 7 we explain the information that's down here on this lower function for the timer. And it gives you a breakdown of all the different details. Okay, let's go to page 8 in our curriculum. And we're going to program these three little functions here for the stage. And I'm going to drag these up here like so. And just kind of move them a little bit. You can see I can scroll back and forth here where my screen is kind of crammed up if I want to this is kind of a little trick here you can move the functions over on top of each other and you keep moving it to the edge of the screen you'll notice that this bar becomes shorter that means the workspace that you have for your scratch program gets larger and larger and larger so that's kind of an easy way to get more space okay when I receive and we want to change this message to stage right whoops look at that I didn't even read my own notes okay we're creating these three broadcast messages right here so go down here to new message and we want to choose stage right okay and you know I'm gonna go ahead and do it this way I pretty much know what I need because I can see the pictures and I can see the data right up here telling me how many of the blocks I need so we're gonna have stage right then we're gonna have stage wrong And then we'll have game over, which I know we have already made. And there you are. Those three hat blocks are ready to go. And we want to go to sounds, which has all the blocks for sound effects and some extra stuff. And we want to drag this underneath stage right. We're going to choose the file called cheer. Okay, and this is a sound file. It came with scratch. You might be wondering where I got the sound file from. Go over here, click on sounds. You can see that I have cheer and screech. And where did I get these? I clicked right here on choose sound from library. And it brings up 
this entire list of all these different pre-made sounds from the people that developed Scratch. So it's very convenient and it's a good way to get some quick sounds while you build out your game. You may not want these sounds in the long term, but it's a good way to put some sound fillers in and get the programming done because most of the work on a game is going to be the programming. If you spend the majority of your time on the sound, then there will be some uh, shortfall on the amount of time you can dedicate to programming. Okay, I need to pay attention here instead of talk. We are looking for the stop block. Okay, so it's under control. We want you to stop. And we're going to change this to stop other scripts in the stage. Okay, and what this will do is when it receives the game over message, it's going to stop any function that happens to be working, especially ones that are playing sound or counting down timers or anything else. Okay, it's just a good, for sure way to ensure that nothing else is running in the background. Once you have everything done and you go to page 9, you'll notice right here it says stage complete. This is telling us we are officially done with the stage and we should have all these functions right here. Okay, if I come over to my Scratch program, I can scroll and see that they're all there. If I wanted to, I can also click on this, uh, you know, zoom out lens and I can zoom out and I can kind of see that they're right there. Some students like to zoom in on the stage complete page and they can go in and see all the functions at one time to create them. Uh, the only problem with that could be is if you're doing everything from the stage complete, you may not be able to come and read all the different information that we have in the red boxes. And some people, when they're doing the stage complete, they don't understand that we're only creating one set of these broadcast messages, and then they end up creating duplicate messages that have different spelling conventions, and that basically kind of uh, messes things up. So now we got the stage complete. We're going to move to step two, which is our paddle. I'm going to zoom back in so I can see things and click on my paddle. And we look down here, it says step two. That means we're only programming one step for the paddle, even though we have two functions. I'm going to start with a smaller one right here, just to get it out of the way. So when I receive broadcast message, game over, it's automatically been selected. We want to go to control, choose stop, and we're going to change it to stop other scripts in the sprites. Now that we have this put together, we're going to go ahead and get this large function built here. And just so you know, for the paddle, when it receives the game over, it stops all the scripts in the sprite. This is almost exactly the same as the one that we've made down here in the stage, except this one says it stops the scripts in the stage, whereas this one stops all the scripts in the sprite. Okay? And you're probably thinking, well, if you click on this, you can stop all the functions. Okay, well, we don't want to do that because some of these functions may still be operating and processing data, such as putting user scores or putting some sort of message on the screen to let the user know that the game is over. And we don't want them to stop. We just want everything to stop with the paddle. So that way, when the game's over, the player can no longer control the paddle. And therefore, we can display any information on the screen without having fear of some variable changing, which could, you know, corrupt things. Okay, enough about that. Let's get on with our function here. So, we want to switch the stage when it receives the message. When I save, was it start paddle? Right there. And we're going to use this happy camper called a forever loop. And the forever loop. We'll keep running forever and ever and ever until it gets a message like this in the same sprite or your computer runs out of uh, electricity for whatever reason. Maybe someone didn't pay the bills. Okay. And right here we're going to be putting two if blocks. And I can see that right over here. I'm using two of these. There's one forever. In, in future videos, sometimes we have a large combination of these. So it's good to see the number that you need because it's kind of hard to see where the blocks line up. Okay, we need two if-else statements. I'm going to go ahead and grab one and stick it inside this if, and then grab another one and put it right inside there. And you can see that I'm building out the structure of my block here with all of my different control blocks. I like doing that because once I get it built out, it's easy to go in and fill in the blanks of the uh, where it takes the Boolean hex blocks or put stack blocks inside of here. So we want to go over here to sensing, and we're going to get this, uh, where to go? There we go. When key is pressed, we want to switch that to the left arrow. That's the left 
arrow on your keyboard. We're going to put it right there. And while we're at it, I'm going to put my mouse over the blue when key left arrow press, right click, choose duplicate, and then I'm going to put it right here. So these two if blocks are essentially going to be the controllers for the paddle. They determine where it goes. And you probably noticed I forgot a block right here. This is a good opportunity to show you how to slide in a block between two other ones. So we'll come over here and we're going to get the set Y2. And we're going to set that Y2 a negative 130 on the Y axis. And that's going to force the paddle to move down to this position. You can barely see. I'll make it a little larger for you. You can see that the paddle is down at the negative 130 position on the Y axis. It won't change up and down on here because if you look at the instructions, we're only going to be adjusting its movement on the X axis. Okay, and X axis moves left and right. Oh, that reminds me. We need to change that to right. So choose the right arrow. Next, we want to get our operators. We're going to get this less than Boolean hex block. Put it right there. And we want to also get a greater than. Now watch what happens when I right click on it. I can choose the greater than symbol. So it gives you some sub menu features with those uh, blocks right there. And then let's go over here to motion. And we're going to say when the X position is less than negative 185. So just so you know, if you look at the stage right here, negative 185 is about the farthest left point of the stage area. And we're saying when this X position is almost is actually less than negative 185, which means it could be at negative 190 or something. We're going to tell it where it is change the x by zero when the left arrow is pressed. What that means is once it gets to the edge, it won't be able to move left any further because of this little piece of code right here. Now, if it's not less than negative 185, we're going to put that right there. We're going to allow it to change x by say negative 12. Okay. I just made that number up because I knew it would look kind of decent. You can put whatever you want on there. But just remember, any adjustments you make on the movement, these parameters for checking these uh, Boolean conditions might change, okay? So one little adjustment on just one single piece of data could alter the structure of uh, all the other data that you put into your program. So be mindful of that. Uh, next, we're going to take this X position, report a block, put it right there, and we're going to say when it's greater than 185, and same concept as before, we don't want to change on the X axis if it's moving greater than positive 185. So positive 185, if you look at the stage, it's right around here, so we don't want it to get too far. Actually, I'm sorry, 185 <coughs> is right around here. I can't get exactly on it, but if you look at the XY coordinates, Right below my mouse cursor, it says 186. Okay, and next we want to duplicate and we're going to change x by positive 12. Okay, if we want, we can double click on this function and we can see that our mouse moves back and forth. Okay, just by double clicking on it without having to run the entire function. If we want, we can click on play and it also will allow us to run the entire function. And the reason it does without anything else being programmed is because we had set all this up on the stage as a central location to run all of our broadcast messages and all of our variable settings so that way everything runs out of the stage and then our different items that we program can all follow in synchronization with that. Let's move on to step three which is our fancy robot and just for the record I drew that robot. Okay we want to go to events. Oh you know what I'm going to show you something to help speed up the process here. See we have, how we create this block right here? Let's just click and drag it over top of the robot, and now the robot has the same script, and it will work exactly for the robot. Now the other scripts for the robot don't apply, so or excuse me, they're not made anywhere else, so we'll have to go ahead and create these. So let's get one in I receive, and we want to choose Start Robot, and we want to select a Go To. We want the export coordinates of 0, so it's in the middle of the x-axis, and 130, oh, it is already in there for me. And then we want to switch the costume to costume number 3. Okay, that's just to start off. You can pick any you want. The costumes are right over here. You got costume 2, 3, and 4. Uh, costume 2, we don't really use costume 2. I just kind of drew the head for costume 2 right here. I'm not a very good artist, so I'll try my best. 
And actually, if you look real close, a lot of these arms, the arms are actually from another uh, sprite inside Scratch. I just uh, took the vector artwork and removed the arms from it. Okay, enough about my art hack. Let's go to Control, and we want to select the Forever Loop, and we want to get two of these glide blocks, which are right here. And we're going to get those. And we want to choose an operator, pick random for the X, and that one also for the X. We're going to move a positive 1 to 180 on the X random number so we don't know how far it's going to move to the right on the X axis. And then over here, moving back to the left, negative 180 from a negative 1. Okay, so it's going to pick a random number from 1 to 180 for the X axis position. Notice Y axis will always stay at 130. And then down here on the second glide block, we're telling it to pick a random number from negative 180 to negative 1. And you'll notice I didn't pick 0. I didn't pick 0 just because. I mean, we don't need to worry about 0. If it doesn't stop at 0, it's no big deal. So that's the range for moving right with the top one and moving back left with the bottom one. Okay, now just so you know, the glide block right over here is set in seconds. So if you think about your formula for speed distance over time, our time is the same. It's going to be one. So if the distance is greater as we move from right back to left, okay, you'll notice, I can go ahead and run it, You'll notice sometimes it moves real slow, the other times it's going very quickly. Okay, That's just because of that formula for speed that has something to do with us moving a solid one second every time it moves left and right. If you wanted to, you could figure out a way to adjust the time based upon the movement. However, we're just going to kind of keep things simple because this is an entry level program. Next, we want to go to events and we want to say when I receive the robot animation message and come over to looks and switch costume to four. What this will do is it's going to make it look like it's throwing something. Some awesome animation I made. And we got 0.25 seconds. If you didn't have the weight block and was trying to do the animation, check this out. Let's say from costume four to three, just so you can see this. There's three and four, okay? We're going from four, like its arms are up. You can see right there. Let's make it bigger. Okay, so its arms are up. The three, where it looks like it's throwing. Okay? I'll move this over here so you can see. So when I click and run this block right here, you notice nothing happens. That's because there's no time for the computer to pause in between this movement here. If we put this right here, now watch what happens. Okay, now we got a little bit of delay. That allows us to see the animation. Because what was happening was the animation was so fast, nothing was showing up on the screen. You couldn't see anything up there. Okay, and there's a lot of technical details as to why, but what you need to know is the computer was going too fast and it wasn't showing any animation without that weight in between the two different costumes. And that is all the blocks for your robot. Now we are done with the robot and we're going to move on to the non-metal. The good news with programming the non-metal is that we will be able to duplicate a lot of our efforts here. Okay, first off we have our green flag uh, hat tool right here and we're going to choose the hide block right below that. And we're doing this so the sprite is hidden when the game begins because we don't know which uh, element will be used whenever the program is uh, determining with the random number variables. Okay, over here we're going to get the when I receive hat block. And just so you know, I'm going to start pausing the video to get through these things because this video is getting extremely long. Okay, hope it didn't take you this long to do it. Then we're going to choose other scripts in the sprite. If we come to the next page over here, okay, we'll be making this large function that you see before you. I'm going to go ahead and pause the video so that way I can put it together, then you can see all the details. I actually decided not to pause the video because I wanted you to see something while I create it is that when we switch the costume before we had switched the names here we're going to put a random number in here and we can put that like so and we can choose from one to seven 
And what happens is this switches the costume to the number that's assigned to the costume number. So if you click on the costumes tab, you'll notice right here we have one through six. Okay, even though we have seven, don't worry about that. It'll just default to the previous one. But um, so what it's doing is when it says one through seven, it allows the computer to randomly select which costume number right here. Okay, and let's see, let's go ahead and program the rest. It's motion, go to, and we're going to select a go to robot. You know, I'm going to go ahead and change that to six just for fact of saying I did it. And looks, we're going to tell it to show, and then we'll put together the rest of the code. And I'm going to go ahead and pause the video just so it doesn't take too long. Uh, yeah, I think that sounds about right. Actually, no. Okay, I know you think I'm talking in circles here, but I forgot there's little details here. So the repeat until block, we want this, and this is important because the or hex block will go right there, and then inside of it, we will put the less than block. Whoops, you gotta be careful there. And then over here, we're going to get a sensing, and we'll get the touching paddle block, which is right there, okay. And we're gonna click on the drop down menu, and it's looking for the sprite called paddle. All right, and we want to go to motion, get the Y position, put that in the less than, and here we're gonna type in negative 160. And what this code is doing is, it's telling the program that we're gonna keep repeating the material inside here until the sprite it's going to keep moving down until it's less than negative 160 on the y-axis or it's touching the paddle. And we can tell it to move by putting in change y by and we'll select the variable called element drop rate. That's going to control the speed of the motion of the sprite as it goes down. And you'll remember we set a value to that and I believe in the stage. Okay, next we want to if else. Looks like we're using three of those. So I'm coming here to control. Let me get my if else, and it looks like they're nested. I'm gonna right click, choose duplicate, put one inside the if section, right click, duplicate, choose another one inside the else section. For the first outermost if else block, we're going to get our sensing, and we'll choose paddle. I probably could have just copied and pasted the other one, no big deal. So I got paddle right there. Then we want to get some of our operators. We want the equals. Let's put them right there. Let's use that duplicate so we look cool. And I made a mistake. Right here inside this nested if else block, we're going to put first a not. And what this is saying, we're saying this is not true. So we are saying that the variable element to catch is not equal to one. So if it's not equal to one, we'll perform whatever actions inside here. And we'll get to that in a second. Let's fill in the rest of the material so that way we stay in order here. Okay, so we want the broadcast message and let's go ahead and drag it right there. And let's get the data. We'll choose change. We'll set the uh, proper settings right now. So we want stage right. There we go. And choose the variable name called player score. And I'm going to right click and choose duplicate. And I probably went ahead too fast. I should have changed this to a value of 10, which you can see right over here. And this one for player score, we're going to change it by negative 10. Okay, and then, actually, I, whoops, I forgot to do this too. Okay, so we want to get the element to, or the element to catch, not the element drop rate. Sorry, I got a cord in my face. I can't see around it. So the element to catch, and we're going to set that to 1. So that way, if it touches the paddle, this value is true. Element to catch is equal to 1. We're going to broadcast stage right, which will send a message to the shader and some other places that tells it to perform a function. Then we're going to change the player score by a positive 10. If it's not set to 1, we're going to set the value down here below, which is negative 10. And this will be stage wrong, because that was the wrong thing to do. Okie dokie. And I'm going to copy this and put it right here. 
So the first nested if section is if it's touching the paddle. If this is false, it's going to default down to the else section. And nested inside of that is another if else block. And we're checking to see if it's not equal to element of catch is one. And then we're saying if it's if this is true that it's not equal to one, then we're going to broadcast stage right, which means we missed an element that we were not supposed to catch, so we should be rewarded for not you know missing our proper element, so we'll get five points. If we missed an element we were supposed to catch, we're going to deduct five points right down here. Okay, so that's what's happening in this little nested block like so. Last but not least, we want to go to looks and we want to get hide. And we want to get one more broadcast message, which is right here. And we want to change that to random number of elements, like so. Okay, so that should be your completed non-metal block. And I think that's the end of that one. And oh, here's the explanation. So take, take some time to go through and read all that. And then there's the completed screen. And then we move on to the metal. And here's where the it gets kind of a little bit easier. We can drag these functions over to the middle. You can see they're the same exact ones that we created over here. So now they're, they're hosted in middle. You can see that they will do the same functionality over here. Next, we go over here. And this looks very familiar, doesn't it? It's the same as the previous one. So let's go back to non metal We're going to click and drag it. on. Make sure your mouse pointer is right over the icon for the uh, middle sprite drop it it automatically goes back but the good news is over here on metal it has copied it over here so it's got all the information we need if you look right here on the broadcast message it says start metal so we're going to change that to start metal and again looks like all of our information is the same uh let's see switch costume number one two through six let's see i have seven on here so i must have uh, copied and pasted the, the wrong one but on the previous item. So we're looking for costume one through seven, and you'll notice that the code works essentially the same, except now we're checking to see if the element to catch variable was set to two, which means we're supposed to be catching a metal as opposed to one, which was the non-metals. Okay, so go through and verify that information to ensure that you got the same exact details as this one. And we'll do the same thing for the metalloid. We'll just drag and drop these over here. And I'm pretty sure that's exactly the same. Let's pull up the instructions just to verify. I made this program like two years ago, so I have a hard time remembering all the details. Okay, so we want to go start metalloid. And we want to make sure that we've got the proper range here, which is one to five. Go to robot. Y position is the same, element drop rate, paddle, element to catch is three, and this element to catch is three. Okay, looks like we're good. So that was everything you need for the metalloid. And then we go to the messenger sprite, which is over here. Okay, the messenger sprite, there's no super major concepts that we haven't talked about yet, except maybe the point and directions. I don't believe we talked about that. So what we're doing is telling the messenger sprite to point 90 degrees, which tells it to face right. If you click on the drop down menu, you can see that scratch tells you if it's right, left, up, or down. Um, sometimes that can trick you because the sprite may not be facing that direction. So always double check what your settings are on your sprite. Let's get when I receive a game over. We're going to get a looks, get the switch costume. And we want to set that to game over. We want the motion block of the XY coordinates zero, 00. We want a control, which is going to be a repeat. We're going to set that to 48. And we want a turn. We're going to turn to the left. And we want to wait. And we're putting the weight of 0 0.01. Okay, so it's pretty fast weight time in between 
each turn in this repeat block. So this repeat block will turn, or excuse me, this repeat block will run 48 times. In 48 times, it'll do this each time. It'll turn 15 degrees to the left, wait uh, about, um, what's that? about a hundredth of a second, and then go back and do it again and again and again. Okay, this helps control the speed and helps keep it moving in a um, nice uh, kind of uniform fashion. Once it's done, we're going to tell it to stop all. So this will stop every single sprite in our program. And just for fun, you should figure out how many total degrees it will turn. So take 48 times 15, and I'll let you go find the results for yourself. Next over here, let's get a when I receive. We want to choose a start element to catch. We want sounds. We want to play the gong sound. Watch out for play sound and play sound until done. This one will just play a sound and let the code execute afterwards and keep playing the sound unless something uh, stops that sound channel. This one will tie up the entire script and it'll keep playing the sound until it's done, then it'll move forward. Uh, both have a good use in the program. In this case, we want to play the sound and we'll allow the program to keep going forward. Okay, so we're going to choose it to start at the uh, 0, negative 160 coordinates. We want a if else block. We're going to put it right there. And we want the equal block. And let's get the element to catch variable. So we're going to say if it's equal to 1, then we're going to tell it to go to motion and go to the x, y coordinate right here. We want the show. And we're going to tell it to switch to the costume called non-metals. All right, so what it's doing is when we get the start element to catch, which is broadcast at the bottom of all these uh, element functions right here. Oh, wrong one. Let's see, where did I put that? Oh, yeah, it's right here. Okay, so when we broadcast start element to catch, when the messenger receives this message, it's going to switch to the particular costume, which is right up here. And it's going to switch based upon what whichever random number was selected. Okay, and let's I'm going to duplicate this if block. Now check this out. So duplicate the if block. It copies everything inside of it. I'm going to paste it right inside there. And I'm going to change this to 2. And then I'm going to change this to metals. And then I'm going to duplicate just from the go to down. And it's just going to copy just the code that's nested inside of this if section. And we're going to put it inside the else. And we're going to change this to metalloids. OK, so if it, element to catch is 1, it'll set it to this costume. If this is not true, it comes down here inside the else section. And if it's set to 2, which is the first thing it checks, if that's true, then we'll set the metals. Then the code stops. If this is not true, it's going to automatically come down here and set it to metalloids. So by default, metalloids will get selected if, these, if neither value 1 or 2 is selected by the computer. And we only selected the range of 1 to 3, so there's a 33% chance approximately of this getting selected. Okay, and I think we got the shader as our last one. Okay, and here's some more explanation on those uh, codes we just made. And... Let's see, here's the shader. Let's make this real quick. So I'll go to events, green hat tool, hide, whoops, motion, get our go to block. We want it zero, zero, so it's in the center. Looks, we want to set the ghost effect, which I like the ghost effect. Ghost effect causes a semi transparency with the uh, image. So it can do some pretty cool uh, features with your graphics there, uh, which is pretty neat when you consider uh, most advanced computer programs don't let you do stuff like that. Uh, well, I guess some of them do. Stage right, and then we want to go to looks. We want to switch the costume to the right element. We want to go to front. This is going to force this image right here to go in front of everything. So it's going to go right in front of everything. Then go to show. We want to go to control. We're going to wait approximately 
0.25 seconds. Then we're going to tell it to hide right here. And I'm going to right click, choose duplicate. And we're going to select this to be stage wrong. And we're going to tell it to switch to the wrong element, which will be the red one. And the same code as you did before. And that's, the, that's all there is to it. Let's click on play and see what happens. So it looks like it says catch non-metals and we are off. Okay, so hopefully yours is working as well. Let me make mine a little bit larger so I can see everything here. Let's make sure our variables are changing properly. So let's see. Oh, player score, I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong variable. Okay, it looks like it's doing right. Now here's something. Notice we got all these variables on the screen. It's, that's kind of annoying, especially if you're trying to make this game to be fun and it's distracting. You can go over to your data section and you can deselect all the variables you don't want. Well, we want player score. Let's get rid of that. You might want game time as well. And you may not want that one. So you can click and drag it up here and put it like so. You can also do this. You can right click on it, choose maybe say large readout, or yeah, or you can choose this one to be large readout, or you can also hide it as well. But I want the player score up there. And I'll leave the name player score so we know what's going on. And then the game time, I'm going to put a normal readout also. So that's kind of a uniform and the players can tell what's going on. So that is all there is to it for the periodic catcher for the elements game.